Hello, my name is Robert Levine. I'm a senior editor with polyphonic.org, and I'm here with a gentleman I've known for a very long time, Brad Buckley. Brad has been a contrabassoonist in the St. Louis Symphony for many years, and I first got to know him through Ixam, where he was Ixam chair, and I was a baby delegate. Uh, I became his successor, and he became my mentor, and we are here to talk about Ixam and its history, and electronic media and some of its history too, which is an area that Brad is a known national expert in on the union side. So, start with uh, Ixam. When did you get involved? I first went to Ixam in 1975. As a delegate? As a delegate. And uh, was actually, it was in 1975 that they established the media committee, and I uh, that was actually all of 13 years after Exum had been founded, or 12, right? Right. Okay. right. And uh, I raised uh, or talked a lot about media at that conference, so they, you know, fo following the old uh, thing about whoever talks about it a lot, put them on the committee. Right. They, they put me on the media committee. Right. So I, I started as a member of the media committee and, and as a delegate in 1975. And then you became, at the time they had a system of regional vice chairs, right. or what did the, they call it? At the time, uh, Ixon was organized with a chairman, a vice chairman, and a uh, regional vice chairman, they were called, besides a secretary treasurer, a right. census ordine editor. Yeah, I subsequently became a regional vice chairman uh, for the southern region. St. Louis was in the southern region. And then uh, in 1980, I became vice chairman when Fred Zanone right. became chairman. Right. And in 1982, I decided I needed a break from it, so I, I uh, chose not to run again, although they asked me to stay on as chairman of the media committee. And I served in that uh, position till 1986. Uh, then I stepped, uh, you know, I stepped down from that in 1986. Then two years later, they asked me to uh, run for chairman, and I did. And I became chairman in, in uh, 1988, and uh, was chairman until 1996. Right. But then you continued on the media committee. Then I continued on the right. media committee until uh, 2002. So, essentially, it was fairly close to almost continuous 27-year involvement. Correct. And of course, you've come to the conference since then as the delegate. Correct. I've come to Ixam uh, a couple of times uh, since, uh, since I, yeah, as the delegate, right, from St. Louis. So you've been coming for well more than probably close to two thirds of Ixam's history. Correct. How's it changed? Well, the issues are different now than they were when, uh, when I first became involved in Ixam. The big issue then was uh, the 52-week season. Um, How many works just had it? Uh, you know, I can't remember, but it wasn't uh, wasn't the majority. Right. And and uh, uh, but everybody was trying to get to 52 weeks, and uh, you know there were a lot of issues about uh, pension. Well, all the orchestras had internal pension plans then. And uh, medical plans and and uh, work rules and yeah everybody was very consumed with uh, with those kinds of issues. Although Fred, when he was chairman, tried to pull the conference in a slightly different direction, and he was trying to have conferences that addressed uh, workplace issues rather than contractual work issues. Um, job satisfaction, you know, there were numbers that were starting to come out then that, that people were not terribly happy playing in symphony orchestras, and uh, why was that? So we were, uh, we were interested in looking at that. And besides that, of course, there was lots of media work going on. In 1980, we put together something called the Symphony AV Agreement, which was this enormously huge, complex agreement uh, it's probably the most, was and still is the most complex agreement that the Federation has. And that, that was an enormous undertaking. We were bringing in musicians from both coasts, and it took us close to a year to p bring that, that uh, agreement to fruition. And that was actually the first AFM agreement, media agreement, that was specifically symphonic. That was the first right. specific symphonic media agreement, and it was television. 
which everybody thought that television was going to be a big uh, thing for symphony orchestras. Television and cable. And uh, yeah, cable. Right. Right. And the, the agreement was very flexible. You could move from one media to the other uh, quickly without a whole lot of bureaucratic hassle. Um, and also it was the, one of the first agreements where there was direct revenue participation. It's the first federation agreement that had direct revenue participation rather than participation in a fund, which is, you know, are what the other uh, federation agreements were. But uh, the funny part was we would, uh, we would meet the managers the day before we had negotiations at the federation and negotiate the contract. And then we'd go to the federation the next day and the negotiations were set piece battles. I think they began to catch on because Victor Fonte Alba was the president of the AF of M at the time. And one time he, lo he looked at Fred and he said, you know, if I didn't know any better, I'd say you guys were negotiating this agreement before you ever got to these meetings. <laughs> well, he knew what was going on, but it was, it was fine with him. Right. And there were some funny times. There was one time when we walked in and said, look, this is what we need in this area. And they said, they'll never give that to you. And we'd, we'd reached agreement over the uh -huh. issues the, the day, day before. before. Right. right. Yeah. So that was, a, that was a pretty interesting experience. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, you know, the issues were, were different. They were, they were uh, simpler. Uh, we, didn't, we weren't worried about whether orchestras were going to, uh, you know, fall out of existence. Mm. Striking was, was a thing that most orchestras did most of the time, uh, you know, going on strike. So uh, there was a lot of labor strife. Uh, it's a lot different than it is now. Who was the um, chair when you came in? When I came in, the chair was Irving Siegel, a viola okay. player from the, from the Philadelphia right. Orchestra. And in later years, as Irving told me, he said, you know, I don't know how you do this job because when I was chairman, he said, I could sit down at my kitchen table on Saturday morning and catch up on all the Ixon paperwork <clears throat> and things that he had to do. He said, now it looks like a full-time job. And I said, well, it, it is. It's evolved from what it was. To the extent you had a mentor, my impression watching you all the years, it was probably Fred. That is correct. Yeah, Fred was uh, definitely uh, definitely a mentor. He was a very close friend. He and I worked uh, very closely together, and, and uh, I learned a lot from him. Fred has a, a very interesting way of looking at problems what, that what's nobody I've ever met. What, I mean, what did you learn? What did you end up doing differently as a result of that? Well, hard, I know it's a hard question to answer. But. Yeah. Well, what, what I did differently than Fred did was at the time that I took over as chairman, there was a lot of strife going on between the union and the orchestras. Seattle left the union. It was that year. Yeah, fact, it was that it? year, yeah. 19. As a matter of fact, I was elected chairman and, and immediately got on a plane and went to Seattle to try to keep them from leaving the union. And uh, we were not successful. I was there, Dennis Dreef, the then president of the RMA, uh, Richard Totasak, international officer, who you know, well, Richard is with us anymore, but, uh, yeah. uh, you know, but I immediately, I was in Seattle for a week trying to keep them from leaving the union. And uh, we, it, you know, they left the union and, and the orchestras were, were pretty restive about, you know, the issues that caused uh, Seattle to leave the union. And we decided we had one of two things. We could either try to take Ixam in mass out of the AF of M, or we could try to reform the AF of M and, and uh, uh, make it more uh, amenable to what our needs were. And I decided that taking the orchestras out of the AF of M was not a viable uh, option. Because, uh, first of all, we either had to all leave or all stay. Right. We couldn't be right. half one way and half. And there were too many orchestras that would not leave their home locals. So we went, uh, we went the route of trying to improve the AF of M. That was when I managed to meet, that was when I met Bill Rail. Uh, Bill was, uh, was one of the finest union organizers that I ever met. Um, you know, this, this guy was, uh, he was a living embodiment of trade unionism. And he uh, worked for years as, as a uh, uh, assistant director of organizing for the AFL CIO in Washington, very important job. And he had retired at that time, but he was doing consulting work. And he came in and consulted for us, and he did it for very little money. He just was fascinated 
with uh, with uh, this group of symphony yeah. musicians and it was rail that that came up with something called